today? The cleanup guy, that's right. That can mean all kinds of things, by the way. It's great to come together to worship God. Welcome once again to all of our guests here today. We're glad to have you in this place, a place that we love and a place where we gather together as New Testament Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, to worship on Sundays. I want to especially welcome, once again, our youth corps. They're here with us, seated right over here, and they're a great bunch. And they've just arrived in Philadelphia. You know it's summertime when Youth Corps rolls into town. And uh, very excited for them, but we're also very excited that Jameson and Lauren are uh, heading up this Youth Corps. It's always great to have the Malcolms in town. Uh, they lead the church and state college that we love very, very, very much. And so glad to have them with us. I also want to say, for those that were with us last Sunday here, uh, we had a phenomenal worship service. I was so proud of our teen ministry, our youth and family ministry. It was such an awesome service that at the end I thought, you know what? We're just going to turn the church over to the teen ministry and let them run things. Because they were so strong in their convictions and so clear in their thoughts and, and, and really connected well and really brought the word to us last Sunday. And I was so proud of them. And for those of us that have been in the kingdom of God for a little while, it's always great to see the next generations coming up. And so, uh, once again, very, very proud of them, very excited for them. I think some of those folks are going into full-time ministry would be my guess. I'm also excited that we've had two baptisms over the past week. And I'd like to have, first of all, Khalif uh, Herbin stand. He's a Temple student. And uh, where's Khalif? There he is right there. Great to have you, brother. Congratulations on your baptism. And then Kete Makathini was baptized. Stand up, Kete. Very, very excited to have our new sister in Christ as well. It's a great time. I love the summer. I love just being together. I love camp and all that goes on and things that happen here in the church. And by the way, there's a worship service even out at camp today for a lot of people that have come in. And I was just told that 131 people are worshiping Christ out at the camp this morning. So big service out there as well. Lots, lots going on. Now, if you're new to us, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. Uh, we have a theme for the year and you can see it. It's entitled, I Believe. And uh, we have been really focusing on what do we believe? What do we hold as near and dear in terms of God's word and his expectations for us? And so we're going to continue that today. But in particular, I want to talk about the fact that I believe it matters what we believe. Amen. What you believe matters. In our day and age where everybody's trying to be politically correct and balanced and fair to everybody else and not wanting to offend and and there's some reason for that, I get that. But sometimes we get so eager to keep everybody happy that we never actually take a stand for the truth. So once again, as I start my sermon today, let me say that I love all of you in the room today. I like all of you in the room today. But I've got a responsibility as an evangelist, as a preacher of God's word, to make sure that we square up with the scriptures. That we get honest with God and what God has to say. So with that in mind, once again, let me say it matters what you believe. Can I get an amen from the church? There's a lot of things in life that really don't matter. You know that? Let's take a little vote here. Coke or Pepsi? How many for Coke? Round of applause. Oh, hands up. Okay. Hands up. Coke. Okay, hands down. Pepsi. There's a lot of Pepsi drinkers over here. I don't know what that means. All right. Coke or Pepsi, guess what? It really doesn't matter. Okay? You may think it does. You may be a strong advocate for your fizzy beverage of choice. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Hear this. It doesn't matter what zodiac sign you were born under. 
we're not going to get a show of hands. But if you call yourself a Christian, but you've got to check your zodiac every day, let me encourage you later on, in a quiet moment with the Word of God, you look up Isaiah 47 verse 13. Because that stuff's dangerous. When you start getting into astrology and you know, all that kind of stuff, it can lead us to some bad places. God really says that does, it doesn't matter what sign you were born under. Let's not get caught up in that. Television. <laughs> Television really doesn't matter. I know we think it does and it's our way to chill out or we've got our little favorite show that we like to watch or whatever and it's our way to decompress and I get all that but you know the world would still, still keep turning if television disappeared. It doesn't matter. Okay? Are we okay with that? Here's one that's going to get you riled up. And we've got opposite ends in the room here on this one. Sports. Alright. It pains me to say it. I'm a fan. I like it. But you know, we've got Angie Stout sitting over here with her husband Ed. And I have heard from Angie more than a few times. I've heard her sigh when we make another sports analogy from the pulpit. She's like, can we stop doing that? Everything doesn't have to be tied to sports. <laughs> then on the other hand, we've got Norman over here. Works for the Eagles. And he's a great brother in Christ. And that's his job. That's what he does. And, and I'm all for that. It's, it's a way of, once again, decompressing, being entertained, having your team, cheering, unity, all that kind of stuff. But the truth of the matter is, it's just sports. It's just sports. Whether you're a Cavaliers fan... Golden State fan. It's just sports. Newsflash to some of the older men in the room. Your accomplishments in high school at this stage. I get it. But it's time to let it go, bro. It's, it's okay. Those are things, and there's a bunch more. But when it gets down to it, life and death, real issues, the globe, all that's happening in the world, those things don't matter that much. You've got to let them go. It's got to get all caught up in them. There are things that do matter. Respect matters. We're losing. Respect. People in our society don't know how to show respect. Up and coming generations need to learn how to respect. Respect matters. Finishing what, you're, what you start matters. Being able to see things to completion. That's very important. That matters. Doing hard things. And doing hard things first. That matters. I like what Mark Twain said. He said, if you've got to eat two frogs, eat the big one first. <laughs> His point was, if you've got to do something you really don't want to do, get the hard part done first. Just get it out of the way. Eat the big one first. Doing hard things. It's a sign of character. Pushing yourself, making yourself do hard things. Humility Come on, bro. matters. Being able to show humility, it matters. Honesty matters. It's not what you can get away with. It's can you really be open and be honest and lay it all out in front of somebody else, which leads to the last one. Openness. Amen. Openness matters. Yeah. No matter what the repercussions may be, being honest, being open being genuine, being vulnerable, we're losing the ability to do that in our culture. But it matters. It makes a difference. 
those are things in life that matters. Spiritual things obviously matter. I heard a story about a very world-renowned theologian. And there was a certain difficulty in New Testament scripture that he told everybody he's going to take a year off and really study this out and really come up with a conclusion on this difficult topic. And so the year was over and the theologian came to a press conference of other well-known uh, biblical historians and theologians and they're all gathered around and the room quieted down and he stepped up to the microphone and he said, in my year of study on this particular topic, I've come up with one very firm conclusion. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And he sat down. It wasn't a joke. He wasn't kidding. He says that's what really matters. That's very, very important. In the Old Testament, Solomon, considered biblically to be the wisest man in the world, in the end of his writing Ecclesiastes, in chapter 12, verse 13, after seeing the many ways that he tried, the things that he did, wine, women, song, projects, control of masses amounts of wealth and people, all the sort of stuff he had at his disposal at the end of Ecclesiastes, he says, here's my conclusion, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. He said, I've tried it all. I've been able to try it all. I've had nothing that wasn't at my disposal. And here's my conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's the duty of man. That's what we're supposed to do. He's saying that's what really matters. It matters what we believe, doesn't it? Go to 2 Samuel in chapter 6. And we're going to wrestle with a difficult passage here. This is the text that all the other regions are looking at today as we continue to move ahead with our I believe theme. 2 Samuel chapter 6 starting in verse 1 through verse 11. This is of course during the time of David's reign. Saul has been defeated. David takes over the kingdom. He's been victorious over the Philistines. And now he has the opportunity to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to God's people. Amen. You know about the Ark of the Covenant, right? Yeah. Saw the movie? Yeah. Okay. Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yeah. Okay. It's a little different than that, but... It says in verse 1, David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Bala in Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name, the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. It says they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ohio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new car cart with the ark of God on it. And when Ohio was walking in front of it, and David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs, and with harps, and lyres, and tambourines, and sistrums, and cymbals. Verse 6. It says, when they came to the threshing floor of Nikon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God, because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Verse 8, then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, the place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. In the words of Jesus' disciples, this is a hard teaching, Lord. 
this is a tough passage of scripture. If you're reaching out to one of your neighbors and you say, hey, let's get together and study the Bible, you kind of hope this isn't a verse they pick to talk about. Because we come across David, the new king. At a time of great celebration, he's defeated the Philistines. He's reclaimed the Ark of the Covenant. And the Israelites, and there's a whole bunch of them here, 30,000, are gathered together in celebration and just having a party, just praising God. I mean, what a positive and upbeat scene. Fantastic. The Ark of the Covenant's been put on a new cart. It's being hauled back to the city of David. And the celebration is ongoing. But as the, the cart gets into unlevel ground, maybe some ruts or furrows in unplowed ground or something, the cart begins to shift. And as the cart shifts, the Ark of the Covenant, God's Ark, begins to slide. And there are these two guys, two brothers, that are walking beside it. One of them named Uzzah. And Uzzah was probably a guy like you or me, just a good-hearted guy, just trying to do God's will and please God and was engaged in the celebration and so fired up that God's ark was coming back to God's people and he sees the ark start to slide and to slip and he doesn't want to see ark's God fall off the cart and into the mud, so he simply reaches out his hands and places it on the ark to keep it from falling. And he dies. Right then and there. No warning, no electric zap shock, he's dead. That's the end of Uzzah. That seems harsh. It seems unfair. This guy just seems like collateral damage. Why should he have to die? He was a good guy, he was trying to do a good thing and yet he's dead on the ground and that's exactly David's reaction, right? <clears throat> King David, who was into the celebration when Uzzah dies and everything stops. And 30,000 Israelites go quiet. It says David's anger burns. And he was afraid of God. And then he said he stopped the movement of the ark to the city of David and instead it got left in a little town because yep. David didn't want to take it into the city. Right. This is a hard teaching, can I get an amen from the church? Yeah. This is unsettling. You ever study the Bible with somebody and, or you're just talking about having a Bible study and they say, well, I like the God of the New Testament but I don't really care much for the God of the Old Testament. You ever hear that? Yeah, and sometimes maybe in our heart of hearts we get a little bit like that as well. Let me tell you, the God of the New Testament and the God of the Old Testament are the same God. Okay, we, we got to take the package deal. You know, God is God. We may not understand everything, but it's the same God, Old Testament, New Testament. You ever sometimes get angry? with God. Yep. Do you ever sometimes get afraid because you don't understand what God has just done? We've had some announcements here in our fellowship even today and Chewy and family, our hearts go out. Yep. You know, to those who are suffering loss, yep. to Joby Kurtz's family. You know, we, we, we see loss, we wonder why things happen. We get hurt, we get angry, and sometimes like David we say, that's as far as I'm going, I'm going to put some distance between me and God. That's what David really did. So I'm going to put some distance between God and I, I can't keep going in this direction, I don't understand, this is confusing to me. We get like that. We get hurt. Maybe we as disciples came into the kingdom of God with our lives being upside down. Man, I appreciate Willie's vulnerability as he shared in his communion today. You know, we see what happens before the cross and how we get changed after the cross, but, but then sometimes even after the cross, life can get a little hard. I know the Jenkins family's been going through some family difficulties even this week. 
And sometimes we can be like David. I don't get it, God. I'm confused. I, I thought if I gave myself to you and dedicated myself to you, I would understand everything. And it can cause us to be angry. It can cause us to be afraid. Or even worse, it can cause us to keep God at arm's length. To say, that's as far as I go. I'll still be around, but, but that's as far as I go, God. Is it God's problem? Is God harsh, cruel, mean, out to zap guys like us are dead? No. Church, can we be in agreement that God is a loving God? <laughs> that our God wants all men to be saved. That he wants everybody to come to a knowledge of the truth. And God goes to the infinite limit of, 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 of doing what he can to make sure that we're taken care of. Our God is not a distant being in the cosmos. He's a father. He cares about every hair on our head. He cares about the little sparrow that falls to the ground. His son Jesus stood at the gates of Jerusalem and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. That's a God of compassion. That's a son, a savior that cares about people. Yeah. Have you forgotten about that God? Have you made God into a mean, wicked old man in the sky somewhere? It's not God's problem. It's our problem. Go to the book of Exodus in chapter 25. It matters what you believe, church. It matters. I'm not sure what that is. I'm sure somebody will fix it. Surrounded by very capable people. Exodus chapter 25. This is a flashback. This is long before the time of David. But this is God giving instructions about the Ark of the Covenant. In verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 10. The instructions from God about the Ark, it says, Have them make a chest of Achaia wood, two and a half cubits long, and a cubit and a half wide, a cubit and a half high. Overlay it with pure gold both inside and out, and make a gold molding around it. Cast four gold rings for it and fasten them to the four feet with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Verse 13. Then make poles of a kale wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings on the sides of the chest to carry it. The poles are to remain in the rings of this ark. They are not to be removed. Then put the ark uh, put in the ark the testimony which I give you. God gave incredibly minute details about the construction of the Ark of the Covenant, didn't he? He didn't hold back. He said, this is exactly the way I want it to be. He told them how big it was. He, know how, he told them how to overlay it with gold. And in particular, he said, put rings on the side of it and then take these special poles made of the special wood that are overlaid with gold and slide those poles into the rings and you carry it with that. He even determined that there would be a special group of people to handle and carry the ark. That was the Levites. If you go on to Numbers chapter 4, We read about the ark some more. Aaron, who was Moses' brother and in charge of the Levites, in verse 15, Numbers chapter 4, after Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles, and when the camp is ready to move, the Kotholites are to come and do the carrying. But they must, must not touch the holy things or they will die. The Kothalites are to carry those things that are in the tent of meeting. Within the Levites, a special group was designated to carry the holy things. First Chronicles chapter 15. Let's go there. Now this is during the time of David, but after the incident that we originally read about Uzzah being struck dead, David has a little, uh, little reflection in First Chronicles chapter 15, starting verse 12. 
This is David speaking. He said to them, you're the heads of the Levitical families. You and your fellow Levites are to consecrate yourselves and bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place I have prepared it. Then get this in verse 13. It was because of you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. There it is, isn't it? It wasn't God's problem. It wasn't God's fault. God wasn't being mean or arbitrary. God was being true to his word. God sticks to his word. The problem is ours. That we get disrespectful towards God and towards his word. We don't spend enough time digging into God's word and really focusing not on the overall picture, but even the details that God wants us to care about. We've got to get back to really understanding that God does care about details. When did we start thinking that details don't matter? How did we get to the point where it doesn't really matter what you believe, just as long as you believe something? How did we get to the point where it's all kind of just up to you, it's subjective, you figure it out for yourself? I think there's a lot of blame to go around in this area. But I'm going to start with religious leaders. I believe religious leaders in our country and around our world are held responsible for not holding to God's word, but instead, instead generalizing things to make it easier on the people. Following God is not easy, my friends. It's challenging. It's a hard life. It's a good life and it's filled with blessings, but you've got to focus on it. Far too many religious leaders have said, oh, it's okay, God knows your heart. Let me tell you the truth, God does know your heart. That's the problem. It's our hearts that are the problem. And far too many religious leaders, men and women that are respected and supposedly are speaking for God, have let people off the hook and have not pointed them back towards God's word and the details that God cares about. Another problem, not just with the religious leaders, but with us. We have misunderstood, but even worse, misapplied grace. Nobody believes more in the grace of God than me. But grace is not an excuse for not caring about what God has to say. For not focusing on the details. Grace comes into effect when we've tried so hard and we're at it and we're giving it our best and we're pouring our hearts into it and we fall short even though we do that. God says my grace is sufficient. But in Romans chapter 6, when Paul says, Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. There's an awful lot of people that left out the by no means. They go on sinning, assuming grace has got it covered. They go on ignoring God's word and not worrying about the details because they think, Well, God understands. God's grace is going to cover me. I'm going to make it in the end because of the grace and the love of God. God is full of grace and he's full of love but it's in effect when we are trying and working and focusing on giving our hearts to God a real problem is we're just not taking God seriously David and those Israelites thought they were doing a good thing about bringing the ark back and that was a good thing that was a time of victory but they forgot about the details. They forgot about God's specific instructions about how to carry the ark. About how it should be handled. About who should handle it. The fact that Uzzah was struck dead was on David to a degree. Because David as the leader at that time did not take the time 
to search the scriptures, to search God's word, and to go back maybe years and to make sure that things were being handled the right way. Details matter. But details also point to relationship. When you really care about somebody, you care about the details, don't you? You know, Kim and I are celebrating our 32nd wedding anniversary this week. And, amen, my awesome and beautiful bride. And so, we've got camp coming up. She's been at camp last week. We've got a lot of stuff going on in the ministry. There's, it's a busy time for us. And so, we looked at our calendar and we figured, you know, if we can take Friday and part of Saturday... And just unplug. It's not a lot of time. But let's get away from everything. Let's go out and have a nice dinner. Let's get a hotel. Let's just enjoy being together and celebrate our anniversary during that time. It was awesome. But the reason it was awesome is because I think we equally cared about making sure the other one knew that we cared about them. And that was shown in the details. I know what she likes. She knows what I like. And you could tell there was extra effort being made on both parts to make sure that the other one felt connected and tied together and that we were having an awesome time. And it was awesome. It was a short time, but it was awesome. You know why? Because of the details. God says when you care about the details, it says something to me about your relationship with me. It says that you really do want to know what I think, how I feel, what specifically I think about this certain issue or not. It means that you're willing to get in and study the Bible and really learn from the Bible. Details matter. Case in point. How many of you in the room have one of these? Okay. Pennsylvania driver's license. Raise your hand. Good and high. You got one of these? All right. We got some young men and women in the auditorium that are working on getting one of these. And that's a good thing. All right, for those of us that have a Pennsylvania driver's license, we had to take a test. Yep. Right? You can't get it without a test. You can't go on eBay and get your driver's license. At least you can't legally do that. If you have, we need to talk after church. You remember that book? Yes. The driver's manual. Not only did it say you needed to drive for 60 hours to practice before you took your driving test, it also said that you've got to read this book. You've got to read these book, this book and know the details because you are going to take a written exam, right? Now, I don't know about you, but I would come across this. I was getting ready to take my exam, and this was a long time ago. Um, but I always had friends that would say, oh man, it's a dead easy test, man. You don't even need to study for it. It's really easy. <laughs> but I thought, no, I'm going to read the book. Some of us in the room have taken that test more than once. <laughs> no show of hands necessary. <laughs> but we worked at it. We, we, we had to study. So we're going to have a little uh, quiz. <laughs> little quiz. Five questions for you. Write down your answer. A, B, C, or D. All right. Question number one. You must use your headlights when other vehicles are not visible from blank feet away. A, 1,000. B, 1,500. C, 1,800. D, 1,200. You must use your headlights when other vehicles are not, uh, are, are not visible from blank feet away. The answer is A, 1,000. Okay, so far you can get your license. Question number two. 
The only time you do not have to stop for a school bus whose red lights are flashing and stop arm is extended is when you A are driving on the opposite side of a divided highway B are behind the bus <laughs> C see no children present D can safely pass on the left the answer is A. You can still keep your license. <laughs> Question number three. The law gives blank the right of way at intersections. A. No one. <laughs> B. Drivers turning left. C. Drivers going straight. D, drivers turning right. The answer is? A, you're wrong. The law gives no one the right of way at the intersection. Turn your licenses in at the end of church. All right, question number four. Question number four. The effect that lack of sleep has on stri safe driving ability is the same as A, the effect that alcohol has, B, the effect that amphetamines have, C, the effect that anger has, and by the way, these are, this is a real test and these are real questions. This is, this is D, the effect that driving with teenagers have, it says that. That's, this is the real deal. The answer is A. A. The effect that alcohol has. Last question. Okay, this is for the Christians in the room. If another driver cuts you off in traffic, you should A. Pull up next to the driver and yell at him or her. B. Ignore the driver. C. Flash your high beams at the driver. D. Get back at the other driver by cutting him or her off. It's not what you would like to do. It's what you're supposed to do according to the laws in the state of Pennsylvania. The answer is B. Ignore the other driver. Okay. You know, <laughs> all right, those of us who have taken the test, if you actually study the book, it's not that hard, right? You're allowed to miss a few here and there, but you know, if you study, it's designed to help you pass, just so you have the knowledge. It's not a trick test, it's not trying to throw you off. But there's some questions that, even as I read out today, that if you hadn't read the book or reviewed it recently, you didn't know. Yeah. Or you got fooled. And for that series about our driving test, yes. if we're so eager to say, I want to be able to legally drive a car in the state of Pennsylvania, so I'm going to read this 50-page, whatever it is, manual, and I'll study it to get the answers right. Why wouldn't something as important as our eternity with God cause us to get more serious and to dig in and to understand that God cares about the details? The state of Pennsylvania cares about the details. They want you to know exactly how long it takes to stop and what the difference is between stopping downhill and stopping on a level surface and how to drive in inclement weather. They want you to know all those details so much that they're willing to give you a test. I've got another test for you. This is the how to become a Christian test. God cares about details. 
Question number one. The best way to find out how to become a Christian is A. From my pastor or trained religious leader. B. From my grandmother who certainly is going to heaven. <laughs> C. From my New Testament religion class at school. Or D. From seriously studying the Bible. The answer is D. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring Word of God. God expects us to study the Word in terms of how to become a Christian, Amen. not just take someone else's word for it. Amen. Question number two. The best time to be saved is, A, as a baby before anything bad can happen. B, at a one-night evangelistic crusade, C, at the end of a church class, or D, the best time to be saved is as an adult that can make an informed biblical decision. In the book of Acts, in chapter 8, verse 36, we look at a conversion where a disciple says, look, here is what, where a individual that's studying the word says, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? The Ethiopian was an adult making an informed decision after having learned from the scriptures. Question number three. The best time to repent of my sins is A. Right after I become a Christian so the Holy Spirit can help me out. You laugh, but a lot of logic in that for some people. B. After I got found out and have no other choice. <laughs> C. Before I have to talk to the leader of our church. <laughs> or D. Before I become a Christian and with godly sorrow. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10. Godly sorrow brings repentance that what? Leads to salvation. Repentance comes before salvation. People that think they got saved, but then they started to repent later on, don't get it. That's not biblical. God cares about the details. Question number four. Saying Jesus is Lord means, A, you can now join the youth group at church. B, it might mean that your workmates may not have lunch with you anymore. C, it might mean that you can get a discount at the religious bookstore. Or D, that every aspect of your life may need to be adjusted for God. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21, not everyone who says Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Amen. Details matter. It matters what you believe. Last question. The very point... When you go from being lost to being saved is A. When you ask Jesus to come into your life. B. When you pray the sinner's prayer. C. When your parents had you baptized as a baby. Or D. When you were immersed in the waters of baptism after responding to your sins and making Jesus Lord of your life. The answer is D. But a lot of people don't know that. Some people in this audience today don't know that. I urge you, study the Bible. Amen. Learn what God has to say. Yeah. Understand that He cares about the details. Amen. Understand that a lot of us have been fed lines like it doesn't matter, or it's all just about your heart, or God doesn't really care, or we're all going to be saved in the end, or it's all about grace or love or whatever. And God says, no! Those things are true, but you've got to get in and find out. We've got to love God enough to, to feed on his word and to get into the details and really drill down deep to know. Bible study, studying God's word, is very important. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to finish in just a minute. You know, we've made a little example using some different types of tests, whether it's for the driver's exam or to become a Christian.
But in 2 Corinthians in chapter 13, it says in verse 5, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? I don't want anybody in this room to fail the test. I care about everybody in this room. We are a loving fellowship. We're not a legalistic fellowship. Amen. We're not a heavy-handed fellowship. We're not a nitpicky fellowship. But we do care about what God says is important. Amen. We do care about what the Bible has to say. Amen. We're going to finish in 2 Samuel in chapter 6. Because this is the end of the matter. David was beside himself with anger and fear and grief and left the Ark of the Covenant in a little town, a little village. But we see in verse 12 of 2 Samuel 6, after David cooled off a little bit, it says, Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the Ark of the God. It must have been a funny thing. This was a little tiny village and they just left the Ark there. And my guess is like everybody's grass grew really nice and flowers bloomed and you know cows started having babies and giving more milk or something. I mean it's like they all went by this little town and it, it, it was like wonderland. Everything's going great here. And they realized this because the ark is there. God's ark is there. So David it says went down and brought the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those, get this, verse 13, those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps. He sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Dare, David, wearing the linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with the shouts and the sounds of trumpets. Amen. They got it right. They didn't think it was that important. And somebody died. And David took it to heart and said, Man, I can't, I can't mess up. What God says is important. He was humble. He, he, he swallowed his pride. He stopped being angry at God. He stopped being confused and distant from God. He humbled out and said, I just got to do it the way God says. Amen. And then they were able to rejoice. That's God's hope for all of us. Is that we just humble out and go, you know, that's what God says. I don't need to fully understand it. I don't know exactly why. I don't get it all, but I'm not God and I don't have to be. Far too many of us are saying, I'm not going to do that because I just don't understand that. You know, I'm coming up on 40 years as a disciple. And there's still plenty I don't understand. But I learned a long time ago that, hey, I'm going to be obedient first. Maybe God will show me later. And as I've gone 40 years, things get revealed. It begins to make more sense as you go. But, you know, you don't understand it right off. There are some of you in this auditorium that are being stubborn before God. You've stuck a stake in the ground and said, I'm not going any further. I'm mad. I'm hurt. I don't get it. I plead with you today. Humble out. Amen. Surrender. Let God's word do the work that he wants to do in your life. Get with somebody. Be open. Confess. Be honest. And let's get to where we can all rejoice together. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for being a God of details. We thank you that things do matter. That we aren't just in a world of everything being arbitrary, but that you care and that you know everything that goes on. Father, I pray that we can be eager to obey, eager to be honest, eager to humble out, and just do your will. Father, help us today if we have things on our heart that need to be confessed, if we're standing opposed to you, if our sins are still blocking our relationship with you, I pray today that we can settle that. Thank you for this time of worship, and we thank you for your word. We pray through your son. Amen. 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 We're going to have a final song. Let's stand and sing.